turn in our Bibles this morning to um, Psalm 23, page uh, 437 in a pew Bible. Psalm 23. We will read this most uh, familiar psalm, and then we'll, we'll take a look at it, because we're studying, if you remember, we are studying the names of God. As you go through the Scriptures, God reveals Himself to us in various names. As a matter of fact, you will find there are 23 different names that God reveals in the Old Testament. And uh, this is one of the names revealed here in Psalm 23 and verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And in that first verse, although... In our English Bible, we don't see it. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. And yet, in a Hebrew uh, text, it says, Jehovah Roe. You can see it up there on the board. And it's a compound name. I didn't write them next to each other. Kind of like a hyphenated compound name, Jehovah Roe. And this is one of the names of the Lord revealed in the Scriptures. The Lord is my shepherd. This is another name given. Jehovah Roe, the Lord, my shepherd shepherd. Now, living in modern America, I don't know much about shepherds. I don't know if you do either. I mean, I, years ago I used to watch a lot of movies. I saw this one movie. I, I thought it was maybe this guy's best movie. It was a perfect vehicle for him. It was a Chevy Chase movie. And, and uh, it was called Fletch. Look, I'm no Mr. Rogers or Mr. Ebert. I can't view these things thumbs up and thumbs down. But, but still, I mean, I watched this thing. I thought it was a perfect vehicle for him. Real funny, a lot of funny lines in there. And at one point, he gets pulled over by this police officer who brings him to the courthouse, and he starts asking him questions. And, you know, what's your name? Fletch. What's your first name? Fletch. Fletch B. Fletch. You know, he's a real smart guy. He says, what do you do, Mr. Fletch? He says, I'm a shepherd. Well, I roared hysterically. Because who, who's a shepherd nowadays? I mean, in America, if you look in the want ads, you won't find any ads in the Buffalo News today for shepherds. And I don't know if there's even a union for shepherds. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. So I don't know much about it. But I had to go back and do some reading. And I have a couple of uh, older works, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia by Philip Schaff, written in the 1800s and in the early 1900s. At least he edited it. Many people have contributed. And it's been updated since then. And I, and I learned uh, some things about a shepherd and what he does and what his duties are and why this is so uh, precious to the people living in this time and why it will be precious to us too. So I wanted to study them a little bit. Uh, just going back, they broke down the duties of the shepherd based on the particular day that he went through. So they, they broke it down like this. They started in the morning. What's the first thing the shepherd does in the morning after he brushes his teeth or whatever? And they said the first thing that he does is that he, he'll get up and he will lead the flock. He'll go before the flock and call them by name and start going before them and, and taking them to a certain place. Now, it was interesting. They talked about two kinds of shepherds that were found over there in, in the area of Palestine. There were shepherds that were very good at, at herding and driving the flock from behind using uh, dogs and using uh, horses or camels, and they could, could herd a flock that way. And then they talked about shepherds that had a very personal relationship with their flocks, a smaller flock they usually had, and they would actually call them by name. And, the, and these are the shepherds that mostly were in the area around Israel. They were small uh, flocks that they had, and they called them by name. Now, I remember hearing a study by a, a pastor up in Canada and he spent some time going through Ireland and Scotland and England, and they still have shepherds over there. And he spent a number of weeks with one of the shepherds up there, and he said that um, these shepherds, I mean, they get to know that flock so well. He said it's not even a matter of what they do with the flock, because he said, I was with the guy a few weeks. 
And he started showing me certain tricks of the trade, how to use a staff, how to use a rod, how to use certain motions, how to do certain things like that. He said, but no matter what I did, the sheep would not respond to me. Even if I did it absolutely perfectly, I mean, if I imitated him perfectly, watch out for imitation because we're not supposed to imitate Christ. The Antichrist imitates Christ. We're supposed to be followers of Christ. And this, he said, I would imitate this guy perfectly, and the sheep would not respond. He said, and then he would speak with his voice, doing the same thing I did, and the sheep would respond instantly. And so the first thing that the shepherd would do in the morning is that he would, he would proceed the flock. A, a, a good shepherd would go before his flock. He would lead them, not get behind them and drive them. He would go first and call to them, and they would follow him trustingly. That was the first thing. They would walk with him as he went that way, and, and they followed him you know, just the way we should be following the Lord Jesus Christ. They said the next thing that would happen is got a little bit later as the uh, sun came up and then it got a little bit warm in the day around 11 a.m. You know how it gets kind of hot. Then he would, around this time, around noon, or let's just say daytime, I'll put. Then what he would do is he would get them to a region where he would provide for them. He would, what he had done is by his knowledge of the hillside, he proceeds... He provides. He, he would, by his knowledge of the hillside and knowing where there were green pastures, he would get them to an area, he would bring them to that pasture, and he would begin to provide for their daily needs. Okay, now, of course, that's what we need, and that's what's spoken of right here in this particular psalm. I mean, just looking at it. The Lord is my shepherd, David says. He says, I shall not want. Why? Because he maketh me to lie down in green pastures, and he leadeth me beside the still waters. One of the things, of course, the sheep need is they need provision of drink. And the thing about the sheep is they're, they're very skittish and they're, they're easily frightened. And if there's running water and there's a brook and there's something that's moving, they're afraid to approach onto it. Okay, they're kind of like, you know, some kittens are like that. They're scaredy cats. Now, we have, we have a pretty bold cat, as bold as a lion. It must be saved. A righteous are bold as a lion. But, but, but some cats, we had one cat that was afraid of everything. People come to the house, that, that cat would disappear. We couldn't find her. Uh, we used to, remember, we used to scurry around outside to look, and we thought she was lost. She was hiding somewhere in the basement or something. Sheep are like this. And so the only way you can provide for them is bringing them by, by the still waters. And that's what a good shepherd does, bringing by still waters. Now, when I think of this and I, I look at it here, I see there's provision made, if you want to apply it to us, there's provision made for, for the three parts that God has given to us. We're made in the image of God. We have a spirit. We have a soul. We have a body. And all things are, are provided for here. First off, there are green pastures for the body. In other words, there's food that we need. Now, the Lord provides for that today. We're taken care of physically. Here, the Good Shepherd is providing the food. The still waters, so often in the scriptures, water is likened to the soul and talks about the, the wicked have the waters that are casting up mire constantly and it's turbulent and there's just no peace and there's no rest for the wicked and yet here for the soul, there's still water for our soul. This is what our Lord does for us. He provides a stillness for us. I don't know about you, but, but life is very hectic. You know, the Bible said that one of the marks of the last days, there'd be two marks in the last days. Knowledge would increase and people would run to and fro. Those would be the two marks of the last di days. Now, we know knowledge is increasing. I mean, if you take a look at the explosion in material, for example, just in, in my field alone in medicine, I mean, uh, it, it took like a hundred years to gather enough information in anatomy to finally get a good textbook together. And then it took like a hundred years to get some basic rudimentary principles of physiology down. But then in the next 25 years, the physiology, the amount of uh, information doubled. And then in the next 10 years, it doubled. And now we're at the point where with the amount of research going on worldwide between Europe and Japan and the United States and all the centers we have, I mean, this knowledge comes fast, so fa forward so fast that we have trouble keeping up with it assimilating it and getting the new ideas down as they're doing research on the microscopic level, taking a look right down at the very genes and the DNA and the and knowledge is just increasing in medicine. Then so you go over to electronics. 
and you go from the tubes, right? And then they went to uh, the little uh, circuits. And then they went from the circuits now to the chips. And transistors, right? Was that what you said? And all the various things. And now, now in the various chips, they're writing down in the silicone. And now they're actually talking about doing some kind of molecular storage of information. Actually using various molecules. And one guy's doing study on using atom atoms and using the magnetic resonance of an atom, whether it's tipped this way magnetically or that way, to store information. Because all you need is an on and off switch to do it. And so it's just in incredible the amount of work. And knowledge is increasing. That's one of the things that's happening. Second thing is running to and fro. We are running to and fro. We were just talking, my father in law came last week and he came from California. And forgive me, Lord, we were complaining about the length of the trip because it took a full 12 hours with layovers. You know, you want to go back about 100 years and see how long it would take to get from California to Buffalo. First off, no one would come from California to Buffalo. Yeah, I mean, people wouldn't come. Even now, people don't come from California to Buffalo. I'm surprised why he did it. I think they only sell one-way tickets from Buffalo to California. But some way, he found a ticket coming. Somehow, he found one coming this way. And it took 12 hours. And we're running to and fro. And, and a study I read in Forbes magazine is that of the various industries around the world, the number two industry in terms of revenue is now the travel industry. People are running to and fro. There's only one industry that makes more money than the travel industry. I think it's the oil industry. And they're going to overtake that very soon. They're going to be the number one industry in the entire world. People are running to and fro. And I don't know about you, but I feel like stop the world, I want to get off. And here the Good Shepherd will give us still waters so that when I spend time in a church service, you know, and the world is out, or we spend time in a Bible study, or time in prayer, or just sitting alone at the kitchen table with the Word and just reading it, I'm by the still waters, and the world just kind of gets put away from me, and the Lord provides for our soul. And this is the things He does right in the daytime. This is what we need to get us through the day. And He does it right here. And He provides for the, the body, he provides for the soul. And notice the one other thing he does in verse 1. I shall not want. I shall not want. That's the spirit. You know, it's the spirit that wants. It's that spirit that says, yea, I want this, or nay, I don't want this, or yes, I'll take the Lord, or no. That's the spirit, the yes or no, the will side of you. And I shall not want. That's, that's the toughest thing to come to is the point where you shall not want. You know, in America, we want what the Joneses have. We want what this person has. We see a new car. And, and by the way, Madison Avenue knows this real well. That's why they change the cars every year. So you'll want a new one. What's the matter with yours? Is it still running fine? Yeah, but, but did you see the way that one looks? My brother-in-law, we were out looking at cars yesterday. You see that T-Bird there? Look what they did on that. That looks really good. And you know, and then you want that. And then, of course, next year it's a, some other thing. A Viper comes out, and then you want that. And, but, but he provides right in the spirit, that stilling of the spirit, where he stops the wanting process. As a matter of fact, the, the Apostle Paul was one day saying in Romans, the most difficult sin that he grappled with was the sin of covetousness. That's the spirit. I want this. I, I want that. And, and he says, that's the thing I fight with the most. He says, I'm not out killing people. I'm not out committing adultery. I'm not out stealing. But a covet, that coveting. And here, he says, you know, I get to the Lord, and I get him as my shepherd, and I get to the point where in my spirit I shall not want. And finally, the spirit is, is stilled and settled. And what a blessing as he takes care of all these needs for us. And, and, and uh, so I like that. The next thing they said that the shepherd had to do was in the evening, when the day was over and he's given all the provisions, the next thing he has to do is find a place for the flock to sleep that evening. He has to procure a good, a good place for them. And not only, and, and uh, of course the word procure, is to get by special effort. I mean, he, while they were out feeding and they were sleeping, he was looking around for places like this will be an ideal place of safety where I know I, they're protected there and they're protected on this flank and they're protected there. And there's an open area here. You'll see how he'll take care of that. And, and so he says, this will be a good place for me to lead them tonight. And of course, he's also procuring for a place tomorrow so they'll have more pasture. And he's procuring, but beyond just procuring 
a region of the field or a region, you know, where they're going to lie down. What he's doing is he brings them back to the fold and one by one he counts and procures every single sheep and lamb to make sure that none are missing that he doesn't miss a single one. That, as a matter of fact, it speaks, to, if you want to just keep your place in the Psalms and turn to the right in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 33, page 584 in a pew Bible. Jeremiah chapter 33. There was a lot of work involved in being a shepherd. As Pastor Colson has like a two or three tape series on it, and he talks about all the individual jobs they did. And it's really, it's a precious thing to hear that how much of the heart of the shepherd is for the, the, the flock. You've got to love him. And, 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 and I mean, especially when it rains. Like, you know, Rob Petrie said, I don't know how sheep stand each other in the rainy season. Have you ever eaten wool when it gets wet? You know, and, uh, but, but he loves them. And when he's bringing them back in the evening, Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 13, it says, In the cities of the mountains, in the cities of the vale, the valley, and in the cities of the south, and in the land of Benjamin, and in the places about Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, shall the flocks pass again under the hands of him that telleth them, saith the Lord. Now, now the word tell is a word for counting. Uh, we, and if we go to the bank, there's a bank teller, and the bank teller's job is to count money. And what he's saying here is the shepherd knows exactly how many sheep and lambs he went out with that morning. And he knows how many lie down in the field that afternoon. And when he brings them back that evening under his hands individually, stroking them and touching them and, and counting them by name, making sure every sheep is back into the fold, procuring it. That's a picture of the shepherd giving security and assurance to the sheep just like the good shepherd does for us and i'm going to show you the parallels and the doctrinal application of this in a moment we're looking at the historical and a little bit of the spiritual i'm going to show you the doctrine in a little bit so you see this the work that's done and now he counts them and he brings them in and he knows he has his entire flock he has all 100 of them if that's how many he had when he started and now it's time for the night and then in the night time His job was to keep watch over them by night and protect. And he protects them at night. Because they're resting and they're confident that nothing's going to happen to them because he is there. He is with them. And his job was to protect from all the various predators. And so many of these predators are nighttime predators. And so it, it required a lot on his part. He had to keep watch by night. Now you remember in the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus was born, who the angel made the announcement to in Luke chapter 2, it says in verse 8, it says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. In other words, this is, this is a one heck of a job. You've got a 24-7 job. They were like interns before interns were around in the hospitals today. When we were interns and we did our internship, we had to do 24-hour calls. And our job was to, to keep watch over the patients at night and to wander around the halls. And, and we used to break up. There were three of us that would cover the place, three interns, and, and one of us would take the ER, and one of us would take the regular floors, and one of us would take the intensive care units, you know, the ICU and the CCU. And our job was just to wander around and make sure things were okay. I remember wandering around the building, and, and you get bored a little bit, but you're watching and listening, and then you get a call over here, and you take care of someone. Well, the shepherds were doing this thousands of years before. And that was their job, to keep over them. Now, it's a real blessing to know that there are good shepherds like that. The sad thing is, there are bad shepherds. The book of Nahum, in, in Nahum chapter 3, that would be page 684 in, in the uh, uh, Pew Bible. Nahum's a very small book in the Old Testament. It's the seventh book. It's just before Habakkuk and after Micah, if that helps you at all. And Nahum is an apocalyptic book. But Nahum, the word Nahum means comforter. That's what the word means. And in Nahum chapter 3 and in verse 18, God is contrasting 
the shepherds of Jerusalem with the shepherds of the Gentile nations around. And he says in, in Nahum 3.18, he says, Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. You know, the, the job of the shepherd was to, to abide and to keep watch in the night. And, and there are other shepherds that aren't keeping watch in the night. And they sleep. And when I think of, and so those, those uh, flocks, those sheep, those lambs now were subject to the, to the night predators, the, the wolves or the, or the hyenas or the coyotes, or they even spoke, David spoke of lions and, and bears, and lions do a lot of their, uh, you know, their, their praying at night. And uh, David took care of that, and he was a good shepherd. But there are shepherds that didn't do their job. I guess if you were a landowner back in Israel, it's tough to find a good shepherd. And, and, and you would thank the Lord if you were able to find one that would watch out for your flock. Not a hireling, but one that really watched out for that flock. Now, today our shepherd, of course, is God, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And back in the Psalms, in Psalm 121, and I don't know about you, but this, this is true for me. You know, most problems, first off, most heart attacks occur during the night. Most accidents occur during the night when vision is poor. Most killings occur during the night. And I think most of your problem with drugs and alcohol occurs during the night. And, and the Lord here in Psalm 121 tells us, in, in Psalm 121, verse 4, Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. And he doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. The shepherd we have watches out for us 24-7. Now, I'll tell you, I noticed a difference in my lifetime in that since I've been saved, since I took Jesus as my Savior, my nights are much more restful. I get the best sleep I've ever gotten. It's amazing. I mean, I, it, it, my wife knows. She says, go up to bed. I kneel down. I pray a little bit. I get in the bed, and three minutes later, I'm sound asleep. And then, and then five, six hours later, boom, I'm up, and I, I don't stir during the night, I don't have a lot of problems, and I have no nightmares, which is a blessing, because I used to have them before I got saved. I don't know what I worried about, all kinds of different things, but, but all those worries are gone, and he that keeps us, keeps us through the night today. I mean, right now, while we're alive, he gives that rest to us. He giveth his beloved sleep, the Bible says. And he watches out for us, and he keeps all those little demons away from us that give us those nightmares. By the way, mare is a word that means devil or demon. That's what the sex and root comes from. And nightmares, really, it's your soul is trying to rest, and a little spirit is trying to make your, your soul restless. And if you don't have the protection of the Lord around you, the, well, <laughs> then the Lord lets the devil have it, just like it happened in Job. But, but he keeps us. And so, not only did they keep them physically, but spiritually, the Lord keeps us today. Now, I want to show you the doctrinal application as we go back and we see the Lord as our shepherd today. The first thing I noticed is way back in Psalm 23. And I'm going to show you the parallels between what the shepherd did in the Old Testament... And, and what the Lord does for us now, now that the Lord has come, and he's, he's given us the New Testament in his blood, the everlasting covenant, as he shed his blood for us at Calvary's cross, I'm going to show you what, what he's done for us. The interesting thing is, when you're in Psalm 23, I have been around to many funerals, and I've been to many different church services. And I have seen and heard Psalm 23 many times in my life from the time I was a little boy. I've seen it, you know, somebody dies sometimes and, and they'll have like on the front a picture of them, a little bit about their life, and on the back they'll have Psalm 23. And that's not uncommon to see that. And I've watched it, even read at funerals, and I've seen people weeping and wailing and you can tell there's no rest. And it's like the words don't mean anything. And I wonder why. Why is that? Now I know why. You don't get to Psalm 23 until you've come past Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is the psalm you must get to before you get to Psalm 23 if you read in order. And look what Psalm 22 is about. Psalm 22 is about the crucifixion 
of Jesus Christ. It's in that particular psalm where he was on the cross, he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He talks about, uh, he says, uh, verse 12, Many bulls have come past me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They've gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. He was hanging on the cross. And what happened? The hip bone dislocated. The shoulder bones dislocated. His bones were out of joint. His rib cage was dislocating as he was attempting to breathe there. This is the picture of him. He says in verse 16, The dogs have come past me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. It's this particular psalm right here that the Lord is going before us. See, this is, you think of the church. And think of the age of the church. Well, the, the church age didn't begin. The morning of the church occurred when he proceeded and went to death before any of us to take the penalty for our sin. He proceeded us in Psalm 22 as the Good Shepherd. And he went before us taking the judgment for us. And that's why he was able to say in John chapter 10, turn to John 10. You don't get to Psalm 23 until you've met him by way of Psalm 22. In John 10, he tells us, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. See, anyone who's taken the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, he went to death before you did. Right? I've taken him as my Savior. He died before I did. He proceeded me through the valley of death. The good shepherd went first for me. Verse 12, But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, he seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he's a hireling. He careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and have am known of mine as the Father knoweth me even so know I the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep voluntarily he laid down his life verse 18 no man taketh it from me but I lay it down of myself I have the power to lay it down Jesus Christ did not have to die he never committed a sin the wages of sin is death he never committed a sin he could have ascended right back up to heaven and waved to everybody but he went to Jerusalem and he laid down his life as the good shepherd. He proceeded us at the morning of the church. In other words, as the good shepherd, he laid the foundation. He is our Savior. He proceeded with the foundation. He laid the foundation of the church. The foundation of the church is Jesus Christ. It is not Peter. Peter couldn't possibly be the foundation of this church, this everlasting church. Only God could do it. And he laid himself down as the foundation and he took upon him the role that only he could as, as Savior. Foundation and Savior, he proceeds as the good shepherd. Dying for the sheep. Praise God. You know, you know in every religion out there, their gods want you to do something for them. There's a religion out there that has a God named Allah that wants young men to kill themselves in His name. He wants the young men to die for Him. We have a Savior. We have a God that was willing to die for us. What a deal. Unbelievable. I mean, the, the angels can't figure it out. In vain, the firstborn seraph tries to plumb the depths of love divine. Our God died for us. He went before us as the good shepherd. So he's the foundation. He is the Savior. He preceded us through the valley of death. Just like the shepherds back then preceded their flock. Now let me show you another thing. Go back to Psalm 23. 
And I'm going to show you something so carefully written here. So you don't get to Psalm 23 until you've come through Psalm 22. Until you've met the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary's cross and realized that He was up there, not for Himself, but for you. Until you realize He was numbered with the transgressors. Until you're willing to come to Him as a transgressor and realize, I belong up there. Yeah, another thing, we're talking about these gods that want something from you. You know, every god wants something from you. You know what the true God wants from you? Your sins. That's all He wants from you. Are you willing to come with your bag of sins and say, Here they are, Lord. I can't take this burden anymore. Be my Savior. Be thou my Savior. That's all the real God wants from you. He doesn't want your works. He wants your sins. I, I still confess a lot. I... <laughs> You know the shepherds? They used to have some sheep that stray around. Imagine the Lord looking down. There goes Brother Mike again. Where's he going? I don't, help me, Lord. i got to come back all the time and, 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 and confess. And, but you know what? That's what he wants from me. The honest admission that I've come short again. Here they are, Lord. Be merciful. Cleanse. And you know what he does. He does with grace and mercy. But notice how this is written. He says, the Lord, verse 1, 23, Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, notice the perfect way it's written. He could easily have said, the Lord is a shepherd. And there's no doubt the Lord is a shepherd. And he could even have said, the Lord is the shepherd. In other words, okay, all your religions of the world, I know you've got your shepherd Buddha and your shepherd Confucius and your shepherd... And here's, here's a, a shepherd, Jesus. And let me tell all of you folks that of all those shepherds, Jesus is the shepherd. The Lord is the shepherd. He could have done that too. He could have put the definite article there. But notice he didn't. He put the personal pronoun there. The Lord is... He's my shepherd. Not even the plural. The Lord is our shepherd. Could have done that too. See at our church here, everybody, the Lord's our shepherd. No, that's not good enough. See, it's very personal. The Lord is my shepherd. The question is, is he your shepherd? I know there was a time in 1993 when I came as a sinner to Calvary's cross by faith, laid down my sin, laid down my works, laid down any hope, and then said, Lord, be my shepherd. Be merciful to me, a sinner. From that day forward, I'm able to read Psalm 23 personally. He's my shepherd. And you know what? All the rest of those verses apply now. I don't want. He leaves me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Well, for his name's sake, not for mine. Not for the name of White Caesar. That's mud. But for the name of Jesus Christ. Since I have the name Christian, he is restoring my soul for his name's sake. For his glory. And so, it's the personal it's very personal with him. And so this psalm, now, in the daytime, now that you've taken him, if you've gotten on the foundation of the rock, now you come to Psalm 23, the psalm of the day, where he now is not just any shepherd, but he's spoken of in Hebrews chapter 13. Turn there, Hebrews chapter 13, page 891 in a few Bibles. And notice the term that now the New Testament gives as, as the shepherd is, is given a threefold uh, manifestation in the New Testament, as God opens up the, what's concealed in the old and brings it forth in the new, and we see him in Psalm in, in Hebrews 13, page 891 in the Pew Bible, Hebrews 13 and verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, remember, he preceded us, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Do you see what he is now as the great shepherd? Here he was our foundation. Here he was dying for the sheep. Now, he is our continuation. 
Here he's living for the sheep. Here he is, our Savior. And now he's our satisfier. In the day, as we are children of the light, and we're no longer children of the night, now he provides for every one of our needs as we continue to live down here for him. And he's the one that works through us. I don't do any good works. If a good work comes out of this body here, it was Him working through me by His Holy Spirit. And I give the glory to God. <coughs> Somebody says, you did such and such well. I say, well, you know, the Lord did that through me. It was a blessing because the Lord helped me. We, we, we sing, make me a blessing, Lord. It's His blessing. All blessings proceed from the Lord. And He works for us. And so now He's the great shepherd. He died for the sheep. Now He's ever living for the sheep. Behold, I am alive forevermore. We have a shepherd that is alive. That's good. You're in big trouble if you're a sheep and your shepherd dies. Mm -hmm. We have a shepherd that ever lives, making intercession for us, taking care of us. We see that in Psalm 23. But let me show you. What about the evening? Well, the evening is coming. And here we see Psalm 24. And I'll show you in the New Testament before you turn there. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, and I'll show you the name that's given. After Hebrews, a couple of books to the right, 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And notice, Peter is speaking to pastors, and he's telling them to, to be gentle with God's flock because it's God's flock and not yours. We have a little, little church here, and we have people who come that are a member of the flock. This isn't my flock. This is the Lord's flock. And my job is just to feed them. And Peter's warning the pastors. He tells them, you better feed them willingly and not for filthy lucre. Verse 3, neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And now notice verse 4, 1 Peter 5, 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear. Here's the chief shepherd. When's he going to appear? Well, you know, the church begun in the morning. And the church is a daytime event. The church is not of the night, okay? We are people of the day. We are to work in the day. The night cometh when no man will work. And when the evening comes, the chief shepherd shall appear. He's going to appear to take us home. He is our expectation. He, he laid the foundation at Calvary. He's a continuation through the 2,000 years as he built the church. He is the chief shepherd that we're expecting and waiting for him to return and come and bring us back to him. Why? Because he's going to procure his flock. Every single lamb and sheep is going to be with him. There will be no schism in the body. There is no such thing as a partial rapture. There is no Christian that will be left behind when the chief shepherd returns to come back. He comes back. Has ex he's our expectation. He is our sovereign. He's coming back with the crown to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. And he's coming back to procure and to pick up the entire body. He won't miss anyone. Let that go. Go to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. Verse 11. Matthew 18, 11, the Lord Jesus teaching his disciples, he says, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. That was his purpose. His purpose was not to teach us doctrine. His purpose was not to live a life of example for us, although those things are all wonderful and we're thankful. His purpose was to save sinners that were hellbound, that had no hope of salvation if he didn't die and pay for their sins. That's why he came. Verse 12, How think ye, if a man have an hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not 
the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. You can bet your bottom dollar that when a person takes Jesus Christ as a Savior and their name gets written in the Lamb's book of life as a little lamb in a book of life there and you're written down that when he comes back as the chief shepherd and we're expecting and waiting for his glorious appearing, not one little sheep will be left behind. Every Christian will be taken to heaven. Anyone in Christ as he procures his flock. That's what Psalm 24 is about. Psalm 24, he comes back and the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And it's about him reigning on this planet. He's not reigning right now. There's a lot of politicians and kings and dukes and whatever's out there. When the Lord comes back, He'll be reigning. And that's what Psalm 24 is. Those three Psalms are perfect pictures. Now, one other thing I noticed is I couldn't find any correlation for the nighttime. I know there's a spiritual correlation, but I couldn't find any doctrinal correlation until I got to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. He's going to procure his flock. You know another word that's connected to the word procure? Procurator. A procurator. This procurator punches Pilate. One authorized to manage the affairs of another. Jesus Christ has been given the authority and power to manage our affairs by God the Father. He's the procurator. He's going to come back and receive us. And look in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 5 why I couldn't find anything like that. Because it says there shall be no night there. After he comes back as the sovereign chief shepherd and procures the flock and brings us home to the Father, there's no night there. The days of night are over. We need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. They're faithful and true. The Lord, my shepherd. You know, curious thing, it's only found one time that phrase in the Scriptures in the Old Testament where you saw it in Psalm 23 verse 1 nestled right between Psalm 22 and Psalm 24 perfectly nestled in there and that is the only name of God that is revealed in the book of the Psalms there is no other name of God that's revealed in the book of the Psalms that doesn't mean you won't find other names in the book of the Psalms but they were revealed earlier or somewhere else but only this one is revealed in the book of the Psalms. Now, I don't know about you in your Bible reading, but the Psalms are one of the greatest books in the Bible. I probably read more of the Psalms than I do of any other book of the Bible. I'm in the Psalms every day, getting comfort, getting provision, by the still waters, taking the wants out of my heart, giving me the assurance that... Someday, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Remember I told you it was personal? The Lord is my shepherd. Someday you go home and you count the personal pronouns in this little tiny psalm with six verses. You'll count 16. 16. 16 is the number of love. John 3.16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him, believeth in Him. What are you believing in? Believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I can say, the Lord is my shepherd. The question I have for you, is He yours? Would you like Him to be? Do you know what he says? He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in unto him. He's done his part. He died at Calvary's cross. He's watching right now from heaven. He's knocking at your heart's door. If you will open the door, he will come in. You open it by prayer. There was a day I came and prayed God, I know I'm a sinner. I can't save myself and no religion down here can do it. I need your son, Jesus. 
Please, Jesus, be my Savior. I opened the door of my heart in 1993. The Lord became my shepherd. This little six-verse psalm is one of the most comforting and precious passages ever written in the history of mankind. And it gets me through so many days of trial and tribulation as it brings me back to still waters. How about you? Would you like that? He waits right now. Let's pray. Father, please, Lord, speak to hearts. Help them see their need. Your Son is the Good Shepherd. He's the Great Shepherd and He's the Chief Shepherd and we look forward to His appearing. Lord, thank You for Your long suffering as You continue to turn other hearts to Jesus. Mm -hmm. By this message, may many enter that fold. Mm -hmm. We give You glory and honor and praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. and great and and what happened and and they stand before God verse 12 and the books were opened the Bible and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works now this is another resurrection happening here folks now we've got a second resurrection here small and dead from all over. You, you were died and they cast your ashes into the sea because that's what you always wanted. You believe in reincarnation. So they, they incinerated you and they burned you and they threw your ashes into the sea and the sea gave up the dead boom and the body comes up, stands before God, before Jesus Christ at the white throne. And now a resurrection is occurring a thousand years later, separated by a thousand years. What about what happens at this resurrection? Verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the resurrection of damnation. This is the resurrection of damnation that Jesus spoke of. It takes place a thousand years after the first one. There is no general resurrection where God you know, you're a good boy, you get to come in. You're a bad boy, you don't get to come in. It all hinges on one thing and one thing only. Did you receive the spiritual resurrection? If you receive the spiritual resurrection, then your name is written in a book called the Book of Life. And when your name gets written in the book of life, when you hear the word of the Son of God and you believe it, then you get to come up at the first resurrection. And all those who are not written in the book of life, <laughs> well, then they get to go into a lake of fire. A thousand years later at the resurrection of damnation. Marvel not at this. He that heareth and believeth on the words that the Son of Man speaketh hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So the threefold resurrection Jesus gives us in a, in a few verses there. 
Now, now to get a little bit more filling on it, to understand some of the details of this resurrection, we can quickly look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, going back to the left. the resurrection of life from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is a mystery. If this were not revealed for us in Scriptures, we wouldn't know the first thing about it. Scientists and doctors and lawyers and philosophers could get together and have all the counsels they want and do all the research they want and they can never come up with this. This is a revelation from God. And it's a mystery to the world at large. None of us knew this until we started studying the Bible. I didn't know it. Did you know this? Did anybody know this stuff? I didn't know this stuff. But the Bible just gives it to us plain and clear. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, there's the key. Have you been willing to believe that Jesus died and rose again for your sins? Are you willing to take Him as your Savior? Well, if you believe that... Just to show you, back up in verse 13 real quick. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. This, we'd be ignorant without this stuff written. Concerning them which are asleep. About asleep is death. Dead Christians. Don't, don't worry about this. That you sorrow not, even as others have no hope. You've lost a loved one. And that loved one was a Christian. And, and people who have no hope, they cry at the gravesite and they go back and they put flowers on year after year because they don't know if they'll ever see them again. Paul says, you don't have to worry about this stuff because verse 14, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again and the person you know believed that, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? God's going to do this? For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. The only sure word we have is this thing right here in your hands. If it weren't God's word, we wouldn't know this. If I were just giving it to you, I wouldn't believe it. Don't trust what Mike Caesar says. Open your Bible and read it. This is the word of the Lord. This we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep pre-event. Go before them which are asleep. Here's how it's going to happen. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. There's your resurrection. There's the resurrection of life. These people that are lying here in graves, when the Lord comes back from heaven, when Jesus himself comes back and he says, Arise, just like he said to Lazarus. Lazarus, arise. And these people will start standing up and coming up at the resurrection of life. Not only will they come up, Notice what will happen to people who are alive. What if it happened right now? So the dead Christians that come out of their graves, verse 17, then we, sh we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, Paul gives you, first, if you will, the, the timeline of this quick event. And the way the timeline is going to work is the people in the graves come up first and then the people who are alive Christians, dead Christians, only dead Christians that believe in the Lord, okay, that believe that Jesus died for them. Those are the ones that come up. Those that sleep in the Lord. Verse 14, them also which, you can circle it, sleep in Jesus. Not people who are just asleep in their grave in Buddha or Mohammed or Catholicism, or anything else, any other ism out there. Only those who have put their full faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, those are the ones that get raised at this resurrection. And they go up first. And then, of course, we follow them quickly. Now, how can we do that in this body? Well, turn back to 1 Corinthians 15. We can't do it in this body. So the Lord's got that worked out. You know, when they send, when NASA sends our people up in rocket ships, they don't let them go in, in street clothes. Okay? They put a special suit on them. We're going to get a special suit too for this trip we're going to take. Here, here it is in, in uh, verse... Uh, there's so much to teach you. I'll try and do it quickly. Uh, verse 35, somebody asks, But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 15 35. And then Paul explains there's different kinds of body. And so he says, verse 42, So also is the resurrection of the dead. Here's how it goes. Our body, our physical body, is sown in corruption. 
I got a corruptible body. It breaks down. Worms feed on it. The cells fall apart. Okay? This is the way our body is. Notice, it is raised in incorruption. We get a new body, an incorruptible body. It is, uh, let me keep reading on here. It, it is sown in dishonor. Okay? The old body I had had lusts of the flesh. It was dishonorable to God. If, if, if I let that body do its thing, I don't know what it might do. <laughs> Thank goodness there was a Holy Spirit trying to rein it back and keep control of it. But that body still had like a mind of its own. Not anymore with the new one. It is raised in glory. That body's not going to want to do things anymore that are bad. It is sown in weakness. Another thing about my body, I needed to sleep last night. I couldn't pull an all-nighter and come here and talk to you. Weak body. <laughs> it is raised in power. We're not going to need to sleep in heaven anymore. 24-7. We're going to be having a good time up there. We're not going to miss any of the good times. Verse 44, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. God is going to give us a body like unto His from heaven. No more a body made of corruptible earthly materials, made of spiritual materials. That's what happens at the resurrection of life. And so what happens is, uh, uh, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Some Christians will not die. Some Christians will be alive the day that the Lord comes back and calls and says, Come on up, everybody. And we're alive going, and I go, What am I going to do in this shirt? I haven't had a chance to wash it. And I got my corruptible body. Well, here's what's going to happen. We shall not all sleep. I didn't get to die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and here's the order, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Now they come out with that new incorruptible body. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible, that's the one in the grave, must put on incorruption. Now he's got an incorruptible body. And this mortal, those are the people standing there, must put on immortality. Now we get a new immortal body in a moment. Boom! Just like that, we get a new body. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that's written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory in Jesus Christ. We're all going up. Those that believe in Jesus. So Jesus teaches, going back to John 5, and you can study the verses and look at them a little more at home. But you go back to John 5, and Jesus teaches a threefold resurrection in these short verses here, verses 24 through 29. And if we didn't have the rest of the Bible, we wouldn't get it. But with the re watering it with the Word of God, it comes up a tree of knowledge, and we see the three resurrections that are here. So, Jesus puts the ball back in your court. Will you believe? Marvel not at this. The hour is coming and now is, now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Do you hear? Would you like life? Why not believe the Son of God? Who else are you going to trust? Who are you going to believe? Trust the Son of God. Get the spiritual resurrection right now so you can go up for the ride on the physical resurrection. We were, we were at this amusement park the other day and they got these roller coasters, you know. And they take you up and it's kind of slow and then all the fun when you go down. Just the opposite. <laughs> this roller coaster goes in the opposite direction. <sighs> we're going to be going up in that direction. <laughs> and, and notice, but he's got something for us to land on. It said we're going to meet in the clouds. <sighs> it's going to catch us with the clouds like a nice mitt. And then we're going up the rest of the way with him. Going to have a great ride. And you only get it if you trust and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Any questions on what we studied today? Uh, yeah. I do have a question. Why is the resurrection in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 20 called the first resurrection? If there's I was hoping you wouldn't go that deep. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you can't teach everything. The first resurrection comes in, he asked me why it's in 20. The first resurrection is actually in three parts. It's like the harvest. And, and it began actually at Calvary in Matthew 27. And that was called the first fruits. And then this is the main harvest. And seven years later, is Revelation, this is Revelation 4. This is when the church goes up. And Revelation 20 is the gleanings 
when those who lived through the tribulation and then got killed in the tribulation by the beast, they go up. So it's a three-part to the first resurrection. It's a little deep, and uh, maybe someday we'll get a chance to teach all those verses. Okay. Yes? This is only the physical resurrection. That is correct, right here, the physical resurrection. So when somebody dies now and that's a believer... Yes, when a believer dies now... When a, when, a, when a believer dies now, first off, your spiritual resurrection takes place at the moment you believe in God. You, 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 boom. You are now, you take Christ as your Savior, you are spiritually resurrected. You hear the voice of the Son of Man. You're now alive to God. You're no longer dead in trespasses and sin. Now you have a relationship with God for the rest of your mortal life on this planet. When you die and your body goes into a grave, God takes that soul, boom, and it's with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. And your soul is up there with the Lord. Now, what's going to happen is that that day of the rapture, He's going to bring the souls with Him and put a new body around those souls of the people that were in graves. And then the people that are standing up like one of us, if it happened today, our soul would now be put in a new body and everybody goes up in their new body around the soul. No, it's different. It's going to be different because uh, this body is corruptible, made from earthy material, and the new body is going to be made of heavenly material. Uh, it, uh, yeah, well, it says that in... Um, let see if I can find the verse. It's in Colossians, I believe. or it's either Col I always find uh, trouble finding this one verse real quick. It's, it's Galatians. Galatians chapter 4, uh, verse 26. The New Jerusalem is where we get the material for our new body. Galatians 4.26 And the New Jerusalem we know is in heaven. We read about that in, in, in Revelation uh, 19, 20, 21, 22. We read about the New Jerusalem. And the New Jerusalem is a heavenly city. And just like God made your present body of the dust of the earth, God's going to make your future body from the dust of the New Jerusalem, which is well, it's gold and precious stones and that's why when he says you see the New Jerusalem, you see the bride, because your body's made of that. So it'll be a, it'll be a different body. It's a spiritual body, completely different, different atomic structure, different organic structure, a lot of changes, a lot of changes, and it doesn't age, and it doesn't get tired, and it doesn't get sick, and it doesn't cry, and what a deal. We're gonna be in the prime of our life with the Savior. A lot of people. This body. Well, well, yeah, probably it will have hands and arms and legs and a head and all that kind of stuff, but with different materials making it up, not not the atoms that make up the earth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll see face to face. The Bible speaks of seeing face to face. We will eat in heaven. All these things we studied when we were in Revelation. Are we going to know each other? Before? Absolutely. We're going to know everybody. Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John recognize Moses and Elijah. How they know them? There's no pictures. There's no cards with them on there. You know everybody. You'll know everybody. We'll know as we're known. You'll know all six billion people in heaven by sight. You won't need cue cards or anything. It'll be great. All right, so let's pray. Father, we thank you for the teaching in John chapter 5, uh, for the three resurrections. Lord, please help people to receive the spiritual resurrection, or, or there's no hope for them. The, the general resurrection is a myth, Lord. So please, please help people to receive.